Thank you, everyone, and welcome to today's talk on climate fiction and the Gothic. I'd also like to say thank you to Dr. Sam Hurst for organizing the wonder that is romancing the Gothic and providing accessibility to the sharing of knowledge for all. It's always an absolute pleasure to be presenting a talk here. And I'd also like to highlight the previous talk that I'd given, which Sam mentioned, um, titled Eco Gothic and the Anthropocene, which is available to watch on YouTube. And I highlight this in particular because the information is quite crucial in exploring climate fiction. So I've summarized some key points at the beginning of this talk, but I do strongly encourage you to give it a watch if you haven't done so already. And if you'd like to contact me with any questions or just have a discussion further about climate fiction, do feel free to pop me an email or you can connect with me over on Twitter, which is just at Gothic Academic, and over on Instagram, which is Strange Books, where I share all of my bookish thoughts about the weird and the wonderful. And this is our outline for today's class. So we'll be talking about those four key terms that I mentioned. We will then be moving on to a timeline of climate anxiety, followed by the definition of climate fiction that I have formed myself because I haven't found one that I think is you know, all encompassing as of yet. Then we move on to the challenges in cli-fi, the gothic and dark ecology, climate change as hyper object, ontology and the Anthropocene. We touch a little bit on climate grief, and then we finish off with the impact of climate fiction. So to begin, the Anthropocene is designated as a new epoch of geological time dominated by human impact on the earth to succeed from the Holocene from the from the mid 20th century. It is generally accepted that the Anthropocene started in the mid 1700s during the Industrial Revolution, where large scale factories were introduced and mass production became a reality, transforming not only our economies, but also our lifestyles. And there is an argument to be made here that the origins are rooted within the emergence of agricultural practices, but that is um, an area that is still in contention. So it's mostly largely agreed to have started with the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution was then followed by a period known as the Great Acceleration, which boomed in the decades following the end of the Second World War. This was a period of unprecedented growth in population on the one hand and consumption on the other. Ultimately, at its core, the Anthropocene acknowledges humans as the driving force of change to Earth's climate and ecosystems, and its current state of climate crisis. Eco-horror is generally interpreted as a genre level, and this is our second term that we're looking at here. It is a type of horror fiction. It's used to describe texts in nature, which, uh, in which nature fights back and in which there is a distinct environmental message which seeks to raise awareness and even incite action. Eco-horror emerged alongside the Cold War and its nuclear warfare. The genre boomed in the mid to late 1900s with the popularity of creature features that featured non-human vengeance directly on humans. So we move on to our third term, which is none other than the eco-gothic. The eco-gothic is a relatively new field of study with its official recognition being noted alongside the first definitive publication in 2013 of the same name, eco-gothic, edited by Andrew Smith and William Hughes. Rather than a genre label, eco-gothic is commonly understood as a theoretical framework that takes theories of eco-criticism and considers these alongside the gothic. It provides a way of interrogating and interpreting our increasingly troubled relationship with ecology. And the godfathers of this eco-gothic theory include Timothy Hillard, who is the first to directly make the connection between eco-criticism and the gothic in 2009, as well as Simon C. Estock, who proposed the theory of ecophobia, also in 2009, which we'll look at in just a moment. Ultimately, the eco-gothic highlights a pivotal pivotal shift towards darker environmental realities, and thus it is a space in which nature becomes constituted in the Gothic as a space of crisis, which conceptually creates a point of contact with the ecological, opening up to further exploration. 
And so in terms of ecophobia, this is defined as a irrational and groundless hatred, often fear, of the natural world that is as present and subtle in our daily lives and uh, is present within literature um, to such an extent such as homophobia, racism and sexism. It is this fear, Estoc argues, that rests at the core of the eco-Gothic. And in a similar vein, we can understand this anxiety and fear through the uncanny presence of global warming in our daily lives. Climate change thus exists as a hyper object that haunts us every day through repetitions of cause and effect. And we'll be delving into this idea of hyper objects in more detail a little later. So those are the four key terms. I know I went through that pretty quick but I'd like you to keep these in mind now as we turn our attention to none other than climate fiction. And to begin, it's really important to understand how we've got here. So climate anxiety is a relatively new term that has emerged in recent years. It refers to the feelings of fear, stress, and worry that individuals experience in response to the current state of the planet's climate crisis and the potential severe future consequences of continuously stalled efforts for positive change. Climate anxiety is a direct result of the cultural society in which we live, where we, we are bombarded with news of catastrophic events across the globe including natural disasters, extreme weather conditions, and the ongoing loss of biodiversity, as well as species extinction. Many individuals, especially younger generations, are feeling overwhelmed, helpless, and anxious about not only their futures, but the future of the planet. And although commonly discussed in relation to younger generations, such as Gen Z, climate anxiety is not limited to, limited to any particular demographic. It affects people of all ages, genders, cultures, and socioeconomic backgrounds. And as we can see here in this quote by Maslin, he notes that climate change is no longer a scientific, or rather no longer just a scientific concern, but encompasses economic, sociology, geopolitics, national and local politics, law, and health. And I do want to just point out here that although it does affect all demographics, it is crucial to understand that there is a massive difference of lived experience when it comes to climate change and the anxieties that emerge alongside it. There is a huge discrepancy between the realities of minority groups such as indigenous people and the global poor, in which climate change is already a horrific fatal reality with direct and immediate consequences versus the impact felt by the global north in which climate change takes shape as a more uncanny nightmare that hasn't fully materialized yet. But ultimately, as time progresses, this fear seems to be less associated with the destructive forces of nature itself, and more with the lack of human action taken to mitigate the damage already done. Although nature does still invoke fear, and sometimes paralyzing, through its awesome power, the recognition of our own role in this destruction is perhaps even more terrifying. We fear what we have done and what we will become. We worry that we've become our own executioner. So how did we exactly get here in terms of this very overwhelming sense of climate anxiety and the prominence that it has within our society? Critics largely agree that ecological anxieties took a firm hold on the collective consciousness of society in the mid to late 1900s during the Cold War. The impact of its nuclear warfare raised significant concerns on the lasting repercussions of such toxic explosive power on the planet. It produced an uncanny fear that we are still haunted by with nuclear disasters such as Chernobyl, and perhaps it has started to worm its way back into more dominant present in our daily lives with the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine. However, even before nuclear power, the emergence of a more ecologically aware society could be noted back in the late 1700s with the Romanticism era, which peaked in the early to mid 1800s. Two prime examples of this include Lord Byron's poem, Darkness, and Mary Shelley's novel, The Last Man, which were published in 1816 and 1826, respectively. In Byron's poem, the sun has been extinguished and the world is plunged into darkness with famine, disease, and death spreading rapidly. While Shelley's apocalyptic novel follows suit, 
with an atmospheric story filled with subliminal imagery of an erratic environment that reflects the protagonist, Lionel Verney's own turmoil as he finds himself immune to a plague that spreads across the globe, wiping out all human life and leaving him as the last man on earth. Both writers paint a bleak picture of an imagined future, one that was no doubt influenced by the real experience they lived through, the eruption of Mount Tambora in 1815 that resulted in the summer or the year without a summer due to a volcanic winter, which I'm not a scientist, but it is essentially when a volcano releases so much sulfur dioxide that it blocks out the sun's rays and thus drops global temperatures. The eruption was the most powerful ever in human history. Then in 1962, we have Rachel Carson's nonfiction book, Silent Spring, that was published. And this book speaks to the dangers of harmful pesticide use, not only on humans, but entire ecosystems. And Carson argues here that the most alarming of all man's assaults upon the environment is the contamination of air, earth, rivers, and sea with dangerous and even lethal materials. The chain of evil it initiates not only in the world that must support life, but in living tissues is for the most part irreversible. And this book is a stark reminder that the human body is just as porous and permeable as the non-human, that, that the divide built between human and nature is entirely fictitious. Silent Spring also shows the ugly truth of colonialism's influence and continued presence in the relationship between human and non-human life. In using pesticides, after all, mankind ultimately seeks absolute control over the earth. And it's important to note here that the Silent, uh, Silent Spring by Carson really propelled the environmental movement forward at the time. Then we have in 1990, the first IPCC, which stands for Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, which was published uh, in the very short book in Cli uh, Climate Change, A Very Short Introduction, Mark Maslin states that the IPCC is recognized as the most authoritative scientific and technical voice on climate change, with widespread influence on various government policies. The 1990 report, like all reports that followed, presented an assessment of the scientific knowledge at the time and produced a consensus on the causes and impacts of global warming, as well as examining various response strategies. The initial report concluded that the increase in global temperatures is due to anthropogenic activities and warned that this would lead to widespread changes in the climate system. The report emphasized the need for urgent action to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, to prevent significant and irreversible, irreversible impacts on our climate, and as a result, our own species livelihoods. The most recent IPCC report was published in March 2023, and I encourage everybody to give it a look if you have the chance. Then we move into 2004, when the blockbuster film The Day After Tomorrow was released in cinemas. Surveys conducted on audiences following the film's release showed an immediate and sustained increase in levels of anxiety in relation to climate change. Significantly, The Day After Tomorrow remains the most widely studied cli-fi disaster film, despite the fact that next year, in 2024, it will be two decades since its initial release. Then in 2006, the Academy Award-winning documentary An Inconvenient Truth was released. This documentary also had a very big impact and was written by former Vice President of the United States of America, Al Gore, focusing on his work to raise both public and political awareness of climate change. In 2007, alongside the IPCC, Al Gore was awarded a Nobel Prize for con his continued campaign on climate change. A significant moment came in terms of the environmental movement in 2015 with the Paris Climate Accords, which was signed by 196 countries. The treaty in, uh, entered into force and thus became legally binding in 2016, and it showcased a commitment to, com to combined global efforts to combat the catastrophic effects of climate change. The Paris Climate Accord states that parties are required to hold global temperatures to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-1990 
industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. It's very scientific. I also want to highlight that the first declaration of a climate emergency was actually made in 2016 and has since been declared by over 40 countries. In 2017, we then have UNESCO's publication of its scientific assessment of climate change impact on world heritage coral reefs, which gave the horrific warning that all 29 world heritage reefs would no longer exist in 2100 unless drastic efforts are made to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. As it stands, the report noted 21 out of 29 of the coral reef examined were under significant stress due to climate change, specifically the warming of ocean temperatures, which can ultimately result in what we see here in the photo, which is what I like to call a coral reef graveyard where a severe bleaching event has occurred. And coral is capable of coming back from bleaching, but it is very, it's a very stressful um, event for it for, to occur to the coral reef. So the more often it happens, the less likely they are to bounce back. And it takes a while for them to do so as well. So then moving into um, 2018, climate change became front and center again with the global movement Friday for Future, Fridays for Future initiated by activist Greta Thunberg, which I'm sure we're all very familiar with. This movement was largely led by children and young people with Thunberg being only 15 years old at the time when she first started striking outside the Swedish parliament building. The strikes highlighted the increased levels of climate anxiety felt by younger generations who feel betrayed and abandoned by older generations and politicians who have historically neglected the urgency of the climate emergency and at times purposefully delayed meaningful action. And we can see the reality of such significant climate anxiety in the quote shown here from the newly published nonfiction book, The Earth Transformed, An Untold History. Franco Pone states, that a major survey of 10,000 children and young people aged 16 to 25, that's the young people portion, across 10 countries found that more than half felt sad, anxious, angry, powerless, helpless, and guilty about climate change. Almost 50% said that their feelings about climate change negatively affected their day-to-day -day lives and functioning, while 75% admitted that they found thinking about the future frightening. And finally, there was, of course, the emergence of COVID-19 in late 2019 that resulted in the declaration of a global pandemic and worldwide lockdowns of various forms that started in 2020 and ended in 2021. And in regards to that, I'm speaking specifically to the lockdowns. However, it was announced just yesterday that the World Health Organization has declared that the COVID-19 pandemic is no longer a global health emergency. It's over. Everything is Fine. I'm sure we all have our opinions on that. So the new coronavirus was largely argued to be a consequence of climate change because of the increased proximity of humans with non-humans through habitat destruction, leading to higher likelihoods of new viruses emerging as they jump from animal to human. Once again, uncannily reminding us all that first and foremost, we too are animals and that our bodies are permeable and thus vulnerable. However, on the positive side of things, the global lockdowns had a beneficial impact on the environment. As people were told to stay indoors and air travel was nearly entirely grounded, greenhouse gas emissions did reduce. However, this was not sustained and therefore did not make as much of an impact on global temperatures as one might have hoped for. If anything, this further emphasized that there is no easy fix to the climate crisis. And I'm not saying that a global pandemic is easy. It was, and in my opinion, still is devastating and horrific. What I am highlighting here is that we can't simply shut everything down for a few months or even a few years and expect to solve all of our problems. Humans have been polluting, contaminating, and abusing the environment for hundreds of years. In order to find a solution, we're going to have to work very hard at it and for a very long time. And so it makes sense that as the climate emergency comes to a tipping point, climate anxiety is one of, if not the most pressing concern of modern society. And this overwhelming contemporary anxiety is 
exactly concluded in the quote displayed here by Bolfin, which reads, there is a generally accepted tenant within cultural studies that different eras are characterized by sets of overarching concerns that these will be and that these will be evident in the era's popular culture. Ecological disaster is one of the overarching concerns for this era. And thus it feels like it was only a matter of time before climate fiction became a dominant narrative within our popular culture, where it can now be found in a multitude of um, various forms, such as literature and film, as well as in other mediums of pop popular culture, such as art exhibits, fashion, etc. So what exactly is climate fiction? The abbreviated form of the term was coined in 2008 by journalist Dan Bloom. And I've yet to really come across a definition of climate fiction that I feel encompasses the true scope of the genre. So I've written my own here for you. I define climate fiction as being interpreted as a genre label. These narratives interact with contemporary anxieties that stem from climate change, exploring the relationship between the human and non-human, largely through speculative fiction and temporal distortion, while remaining rooted to varying degrees in the real weird, which is irrevocably haunted by the Anthropocene. And climate fiction narratives typically portray a world that have been drastically altered by climate change, where natural disasters are more frequent and severe, and humans, whether individual within a community or as a society at large, struggle to adapt. These stories are often set in the not too distant future, offering speculative imaginings of the potential consequences of our current actions, or rather more appropriately inaction, and how we might respond to future environmental challenges. Frequently, these narratives also highlight the ways in which climate change intersects with other socio and political issues, such as inequality, colonialism, the refugee crisis, etc. And some may argue that the genre needs to have its roots in the science of climate change, usually due to the assumption made from its abbreviation, cli-fi, which mirrors sci-fi or science fiction. However, in these narratives, the science isn't as important as the climate itself. Remember, it's climate fiction, not climate science fiction, although there are narratives that certainly fit that too. Basically, what I'm trying to say here is that you can have climate fiction without heavy aspects of climate change science, but it's pretty it's a pretty safe bet that if the science of climate change is at the core of a narrative, then that narrative is indeed climate fiction, and in that case, probably a hybrid with sci-fi. And an example of this can be seen with J.G. Ballard's The Drowned World, which is argued to be the first cli-fi novel. Although I don't agree with this because I read Mary Shelley's The Last Man as climate fiction. And therefore I would argue that The Last Man is one of, if not the first climate fiction novels. We love Mary Shelley, mother of both science fiction and climate fiction, but I digress. And so here is just a small taste of my own personal collection of climate fiction texts which include overlap with some eco-horror texts such as Sealed by Naomi Booth and Tenders the Flesh by Agustina Basterica. I've even included graphic novels with Snowpiercer and children's books to showcase the scope of climate fiction. And the two books on the very right-hand side of the shelf, uh, Heatwave and Untold Night and Day, are great examples of translated works that might not be considered climate fiction, but certainly toe the line by using climate as an uncanny instigator of the story. And again, showing us how these different perspectives can be seen when we, when we meet, move beyond the um, very Anglophone uh, viewing of climate fiction. And what I hope to showcase here is that climate fiction is an area of study with far-reaching potential as it seeps into many contemporary narratives in cha and challenges various forms of understanding the world around us. But climate fiction does have its challenges, specifically breaking away from the idea that cli-fi only exists as a sort of subgenre to science fiction. There is so much more to climate fiction than its propensity towards hybrids pairing, hybrid pairings with science fiction, which are also important and shouldn't be cast aside. However, climate fiction continues to evolve and we are seeing more authors approaching climate change narratives in new and exciting ways that not only consider the past and the future, but significantly the present. <laughs> 
There is also the searing issue that narratives of climate crisis must be both interrupted and disrupted to expose the problematic faults of a perspective that fails to recognize the culpability and responsibility of big industrialized countries and their overwhelming contribution to the negative feedback loop of ecological destruction and collapse. A method of de-Westernizing is needed to destabilize and disrupt the centrality of dominant Western or Eurocentric ways of viewing and understanding the world. Because there is an inherent author bias in the way the narrative of the Anthropocene is told through predominantly Western perspective that encourages a silencing of alternative voices and realities. And so we have to ask ourselves, does climate fiction matter? Can it ever make an actual difference? Or is it destined to be a disturbing, uncanny escapism generated purely for entertainment? And at the core of climate fiction rests ecological fears and anxieties. Thus, thus the Gothic space is alluring to these narratives because as quoted here, the Gothic has the power to unsettle readers more than most other literary or cultural forms because it dwells on widespread anxieties, dread, uh, the horrific, the repellent, and achieves a frisson that other mimetic modes of representation can barely render. So the Gothic has always been focused on repressed histories, as I'm sure we all know, coming back to haunt us in all shapes and forms. And so it makes sense that the Gothic has a critical place within climate fiction. With its propensity for death and destruction, the unveiling of powerful, uncanny non-human entities and haunted ruinous landscapes, the Gothic makes an ideal home for climate fiction narratives. The publication of dark scenes from damaged the from dark scenes from damaged earth, the Gothic Anthropocene, that you can see the cover of here in 2022, further demonstrated the deeply rooted influence of the Gothic in these darker ecological narratives. After all, it is only through dissecting our fears and anxieties that we might attempt to better understand them. The slipperiness between climate fiction and eco-horror in particular can become almost impossible to separate when the climate itself becomes a monstrous entity, acting as a stark warning of the horrific, haunting potential of our present. And this idea of haunting via climate change is especially prominent in the many climate fiction narratives that transform the trope of the haunted house within the Gothic by widening the scope of perception and instead easily reimagines the planet itself as humanity's collective haunted home, one in which the specters of the Anthropocene roam wild and free. And now we're going to take a look at a very blatant example of the Gothic influence on climate fiction in the iconic disaster film, Twister. <laughs> Excellent. So what happens in this scene is essentially there is a juxtaposition between the twister that has touched down and the film that is playing in the drive through which is none other than The Shining. And we have moments of uh, clips in which we have the twister starting to come closer with the character of, uh, is it Jack from The Shining? Yes, Jack, um, who is you know, walking along this hall with the ax in his hand. And then it goes to what I think is one of the best scenes where there's the twister just about to begin to rip through the area with a little sliver of the screen where you can see Jack knocking on the door. And then as his ax is hitting the door, the um, drive through screen is beginning to be broken apart by the twister. And so we see this destruction happening, um, which is then mirrored as the characters all run to find shelter and the roof of this sort of garage type building is being torn apart, mirroring the, the ax that has been going through the door. So in this scene, there is the direct comparison between the monstrous twister that moves towards Joe like a predator and the murderous antagonist of The Shining who hunts his wife and son. 
And the juxtaposition of the tornado and these flashes of scenes from the horror film really make the message here impossible to ignore. And I've put up this still in particular to act as a reminder that this is precisely how the twister is seen in the film as a murderer who killed Joe's father at the beginning of the film. And only just prior to this scene, Joe herself exclaims, you've never seen it miss this house and miss that house and come after you. And it is this awful power of nature that haunts Joe throughout the entire film. And it is this ecological haunting that I argue is crucial to climate fiction. And before I move on, just a, a little aside here that I've included Jack Frost at the bottom as a reminder that in The Shining, there is also this sudden severe climate event in the snowstorm that resulted in the characters being trapped inside the hotel and ultimately leads to Jack's death. And with that, we seamlessly loop back into hauntings. So... I want to bring our attention here to none other than what I like to call climate hauntology. And to understand climate hauntology, we have to look at hauntology itself. So hauntology is a concept that was introduced by Jacques Derrida and is ex uh, explained here by Davies as a um, supplant of its near Toponym ontology, replacing the priority of being and presence with the figure of the ghost as that which is neither present nor absent, neither dead nor alive, a wholly irrecoupable intrusion in our world, which is not comprehensible within our available intellectual frameworks, but whose otherness we are responsible for preserving. And thus, ontology refers to the idea of something that is both present and absent at the same time. It is a feeling of nostalgia or sense of loss that is experienced when we encounter something that is no longer there, but still lingers in our memories or within the surrounding environment. In climate fiction, ontology is present through temporal representations. The past is often depicted as a source of trauma or guilt, and the present is described as in a state of limbo, where the characters are usually trapped between the past and the future, sometimes without any potential for change. The future is then portrayed as uncertain and ominous, where the consequences of the past and its actions, or once again, rather its inactions, are fully realized. And so climate hauntology, as I like to call it, provides an ideal marriage of sorts in showcasing the simultaneous haunted and haunting reality of the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene already haunts us every day through a cause and effect relationship that loops back on itself for eternity. In this way, the Anthropocene becomes a uniquely anti-anthropocentric character within Gothic narratives, both in terms of temporality and geography. It is beyond us, but also within us. It is a deeply dark truth that we, the Anthropos, cannot escape from within our current complicated systems of existence that are simultaneously linear and cyclical in modes of perspective, understanding, and being. And I expand on this idea of a transformative, mutating, haunting understanding of climate change with Derrida's ideas of the arrivante and difference in relation to language and thus being. Derrida argues that language does not convey a pre-existing meaning, but rather creates meaning through a process of continual deferral and difference. It is in constant motion, arriving at each new moment, always in a state of becoming. And this is how we must consider approaching our understanding of climate change. And a fantastic example of this can be seen with the term hyperobjects. The term hyperobjects was first coined by Timothy Morton in 2013. The concept is based in object-oriented ontology, or what I like to call ooh, when we're talking about ontology in and of itself, which Morton explains as a belief that things, I know the joke is so bad, but <laughs> I love it. So it is a belief that things exist profound in a profoundly withdrawn way meaning that they can never be fully understood. And thus Morton argues that hyperobjects um, are entities that are so vast and complex that they cannot be fully understood or perceived by any one individual and that they exist on a scale that is beyond human comprehension. In his own words, Morton states, hyperobjects are 
I can never pronounce this word properly. <laughs> viscous, um, which means that they stick to beings that are involved with them. They are non-local. In other words, any local manifestation of a hyper object is not directly the hyper object. They involve profoundly different temporalities than the human scale ones we are used to. And one of the key characteristics noted here by Morton is the idea that hyper objects are distributed across space and time. They are not confined to a specific location or time period, but rather exist as a network of interrelated entities that span the globe and extend into the future. In saying that hyper objects are non local, Morton is arguing that hyper objects exist in multiple places at once and cannot be contained or isolated in any one location. These slippery elements are what makes it so difficult for humans to grasp the full extent of the impact of hyper objects. They are constantly changing and evolving in response to various environmental and human factors. For example, climate change is a hyper object with widespread impacts across the planet. Its effects cannot be limited to any one region or population. We as a collective are all stuck within climate change, an entanglement that we can only see and understand in fragments, like a plastic bag drifting at sea. And as Hudson argues here, hyper objects are not in every case bad things, the most, but the most talked about hyper objects tend to be the most vivid and disturbing, particularly as they clip in and out of our vision like malevolent ghosts. Thus, Morton proposes that we need to move away from traditional ways of thinking and perceiving the world, which have been largely based on impermeable anthropocentric models of understanding. Instead, we are encouraged to embrace a more ecological approach that recognizes the interconnectedness of all things. We are urged to embrace our poriosity. All of this, of course, speaks to arguments made also by Donna Haraway, who argues for a more fluid and dynamic way of thinking about the world through the deconstruction of the human and nature dichotomy, moving towards a model of symbiosis or as uh, Morton likes to describe it as an ecognosis. But unfortunately, I don't have time to delve into Haraway and her tentacular thinking today, although I do highly recommend going down that wormhole. And so if global warming in the Anthropocene can be identified in general as a hyper object, there is perhaps further significant value in describing it specifically as a kind of haunting. And this haunting can be seen across a plethora of climate fiction, if not, um, as I feel I begin to lean towards, is actually a core component in what makes a narrative climate fiction. It is this exploration of temporality in relation to climate change and its effects that I find most compelling. And there has been a considerable uptick in contemporary texts that are approaching this in new and exciting ways. One book that is an excellent example of this is The Coral Bones by E.J. Swift. Now this one does have clear ties with science fiction with all three women at the heart of the story, a scientist in their own right. There, the aspect that I found most compelling about this book is the fact that the three characters experience life in different moments of the climate crisis, past, present, and future, all happening simultaneously at least for the reader. So there is a 17 year old girl, Judith, uh, who is within the 19th century and is, although destined to be shipped off from Australia to England to marry, convinces her father to bring her along on a voyage. And there is then the marine biologist, Hannah Ishikawa, who is the character set in the present. And she is racing to understand the decay being reported off um, the core or of the coral reef and hers is probably the most bleak of all the narratives. The research she does results in her being in the throes of depression and despair, as the rising ocean temperatures and potential for devastating climate change is met with apathy from those around her. And in the quote shown here, you really get a sense of that climate anxiety at the forefront of her consciousness as she prepares to dive. She explains, I was afraid to dive. 
the realization hit me, terrifying in its alienness and absolutism. I was afraid of what I was going to find and afraid of my reaction when I saw it. Finally, there's Telma, who exists in a world in which climate change has caused devastation and drastic change to human behavior, with government policies controlling human habitation in efforts to rewild parts of the globe and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And in the story, it seems to be working, with global temperatures dropping back down to pre-industrial levels, but with a long way to go before the planet can begin to truly heal. Telma's story is one of hope as she searches for a specific type of fish, the sea dragon, that had long been declared extinct and which is on the cover of the novel that you see pictured here. And perhaps this shows that there is hope for other beings too. There is a clear haunting and blurring of these women whose paths join together and break apart over and over again. And then in Daisy Hillard's Emergency, published in 2022, uh, this is another fantastic example of really an innovative way uh, in which an artist is approaching the climate fiction narrative. This is a dark pastoral novel and was actually written during lockdown. And it uses prose to almost viscerally dissolve boundaries and illustrates the complex entanglement between human and non-human bodies. The story is ultimately a reflection as a woman stuck at home due to lockdown recounts the rural experience of her childhood, one that is both far removed and deeply rooted in the self. It is a book unlike anything I have ever read before, but fantastically encapsulates the fictitious narrative of the theories of ecognosis and ecological symbiosis that Hillard has previously explored in her non-fiction work such as The Second Body, in which she argues both humans and non-humans have both a physical, corporeal body and a collective body that is integral to the multitude of layers that make up various ecosystems. And exploring this quote here, Hillard, that is on the screen, Hillard un Hillard's unnamed narrator describes an observation, an encounter. The quote states, I could see him intimately now, his features were precise and miniature, acorn cup ears, thread fine whiskers radiating in all directions and tiny hand shaped feet. His whole body was vibrating violently. He seemed unable to move. The kestrel had paused again and my gaze moved up and down, drawing a direct line between them, like a lift between two floors of a building. I felt a sense of love arise inside me as huge and widespread as of all was small and specific. And it occurred to me that I could rescue him. And so we imagine she saves this little vol, but its fate is never actually shared, instead lapsing into a story in which the narrator previously made herself tangible in the life of some baby rabbits who were then eaten by their mother as a direct result of her invasion into this space. So we're left frozen in time just like the vol, our bodies and minds vibrating, overheating. Hillard's writing in particular really brings to my mind an example of maybe what Anne Radcliffe might have written if she were alive today. And by saying that, I realize that I might turn some of you away in fear from this novel, but I do highly encourage that you pick it up. It's, it's a very brilliant um, exploration of climate fiction. Two other examples that explore climate fiction narratives in unique ways that further highlight a haunting climate and its increased levels of climate anxiety and specifically climate grief are both The New Wilderness by Diane Cook and the novel Wyvernhoe by Samuel Fisher. So the quote shown here really drives home the importance of narrative in these stories and providing humanity with a space for comprehension and change, which is from The New Wilderness. It reads, I'll tell her this story and the others with all their complications and confusions, because those complications and confusions are what make them true. It feels at times like that is the only instinct left in me. So despite these shared 
themes throughout the novel, specifically of isolation, which I'll touch on in a minute, these books are very different from one another. Insofar as The New Wilderness is a slow burn of a novel, it is set in a dystopian future and reflects on the consequences of pollution that lead to 20 individuals being sent as an experiment into what is called The New Wilderness, a space unspoiled by humans, and these individuals are left to fend for themselves. And this sounds a bit similar to Jeff van der Meer's Area X, but I promise you it is most definitely not. It is a very um, different take on these kind of non, not touched spaces in which humans then find themselves. And whereas Wyvernhoe is set uh, in an alternative present, which I think is actually really interesting in terms of climate fiction and something that I hope more authors will be engaging with. In this story, the community of a small town called Wyvernhoe has been struck by severe weather in the form of continued snowfall, which eventually cuts off the community, a bit like The Shining, to be honest. And likewise, a murderer wielding an axe stands at the heart of it. The novel takes place only over only 24 hours and explores the questions of how a community and its individuals might react to societal collapse in the wake of climate change and its destructive capabilities. Both of these texts engage in micro and macro levels of relationships, with the New Wilderness highlighting the relationship between a mother and growing daughter, and Wyvernhoe centering on the relationship between mother and adult son, while both simultaneously expand their perspectives to examine the relationships we have with our own communities and society at large. And although, as we see from this quote uh, in Wyvernhoe, there is a overwhelming sense of loss that one might call climate grief in having to leave behind our pasts and move towards an unknown future. And as the quote reads here, it shows Joe turns to look back at the village one last time. Alfie stood slightly apart, raises an arm. With a rush of sadness, a fear of nausea, and finally of hope, he steps inside. And this really encompasses this overwhelming sense of loss that a lot of people are experiencing, even in the present time, of various uh, communities and environments which are experiencing a sort of ecological collapse and potentially might disappear from, the, um, from our periphery forever. Now, the character of B from the New Wilderness shows us what it means to be truly connected to the natural world, as she is a character who is both born and raised within this untouched space. And she very significantly shows the sacrifices that must be made to preserve it and how intensely we must fight to make sure that we can be a part of it too. Ultimately, both stories are about complex nature about the complex nature of familial relationships and generational divides and how we react to our own isolation as a species as well as exploring the ecological anxieties we feel at the potential of losing that which we call home and how we might better understand our own experience of climate grief because as we can see here there is some issues in terms of how we experience climate grief Thomas argues that a lot of what is called climate grief is actually a kind of climate despair or of melancholy. Rather than mourning for what is lost and being galvanized to try and protect what is left, we are understandably thrown into a darkness that makes us a revolt against our very sense of being in the world. And so we need to move beyond the sense of hopeless despair that we have when we discuss climate change. And climate fiction is definitely an area in which we can explore this potential. Because we already are mourning our planet and we're falling into this trap of disillusion and detachment um, as we fumble to create, to mutate, to birth new meaning and understanding of climate change. And so popular culture, specifically climate fiction narratives um, in literature and film, need to be looked at in terms of how there might be a real impact being made on its audiences. So one of the biggest issues when discussing impact uh, is that commonly climate fiction narratives ultimately pose no alternative response 
and show no change in behavior of its characters in relation to the broken and disrupted relationship between human and non-human. Ultimately, characters either return to normalcy or must adapt to a new normal. There are no attempts to mitigate the causes of climate change. And this is certainly true for disaster films, in especially in comparison to literature, which I feel explores the area more. However, it is definitely still true for literature, even the literature that actively tries to go against that. But then again, is it even possible to move beyond anthropocentric narratives? Are we capable of moving beyond ourselves for our voices to become entangled with the non-human, to become something distinctly weird and not ourselves? I think there are definitely authors who are exploring these ideas. Like I said, there's Daisy Hillard's Emergency and also Jeff Vandermeer's The Southern Reach Trilogy does a really good job of exploring this. Additionally, um, in terms of negative impacts from climate fiction narratives, we can see that some of the exaggeration, once again, really coming from disaster films here, but also within um, various points of literature, this exaggerated sense of the climate change reacting in such a way, such as in The Day After Tomorrow, 2012, Geostorm, those sorts of very extreme all at once climate events, desensitizes us in a way to the realities of the slow pace that climate change can have. Because ultimately it might feel like it is fast at the moment that we are experiencing, but it, climate change itself has been slow burning for years and we don't know how much more momentum it can pick up. So there's this confusion also of actual um, factual science uh, based within climate change. So climate science, because some of the, when especially you get to the hybrids of sci-fi, some people can be reading those fictional narratives and taking that as fact when we must be reminded that it is fiction. However, there's also a lot of good, I think, in terms of climate fiction, obviously, or else I wouldn't be here talking to you all today, but it really increases awareness and we've been able to see that throughout um, the history of climate fiction and how certain texts really speak to a population at large. And ultimately, it, it really sparks conversation. There's been studies that have shown that in those who are reading climate fiction novels, those people then are more likely to spark up conversations with those in their life, in particular, also with the people who they maybe might not have felt comfortable um, bringing that conversation up before. So that is a really big impact that I think needs a lot more study in terms of how climate fiction is really affecting the conversation. And also I think it um, gives a good uh, potential for creative action, whether that be through active real life action using creative mediums or in exploring these various speculative responses in these fictional narratives. And so we return to this overarching question that has continued to pop up over the course of this talk, and that's whether any of this actually matters. Does climate fiction need to make a difference? As noted by Vandermeer, uh, climate fiction can observe, but can it convince? And this leads us directly into the quote here from Balfin, who argues that popular culture is not only a passive indicator of a society's preoccupations, but is also a guiding force in reflecting concerns. It also plays a reciprocal role in shaping them, distorting them, in inflating them, and crucially, in transmitting them to larger audiences. And this is further supported specifically in relation to the Gothic, with the potential of the ecological uncanny as a space to be embraced in hopes of influencing change in the cultural practices that contribute to the environmental crises. So to conclude, climate fiction is a growing field of study that is constantly folding back in on itself, challenging our preconceptions of what it means to be human and striving to understand, improve and embrace the relationship between humans and non-humans, scattering the illusion that we are corporeal, corporeally impermeable 
the Gothic provides a fascinating space for exploration of the modern society's perception of dark ecologies by confusing and reimagining haunted temporalities. It is an area of research where many branches are starting to bud, ready to burst forward in full bloom, if only we can find it in ourselves to ask the right questions. After all, it is us that we need to understand, not as a separate dominant species, but rather as a part of a collective system of ecosystems that is far beyond our scope of comprehension. As we continue to build, shape and calculate various models of the future, we must look ourselves in the eyes and remember that out of all the systems that we are trying to model into the future, humanity is by far the most complicated and unpredictable. So thank you very much today. I hope you all enjoyed this talk on climate fiction and the Gothic. This is a field of study that I'm very passionate about and one which I hope to um, you know, explore further with a PhD thesis, which I already have somewhat in the works, but it'll be a couple of years till I get there. So do keep me in mind, everyone, if you see studentships starting in February 2024 and beyond. But until then, I will continue to unearth the important truths and potential in climate fiction in whatever small ways that I can. Once again, thank you so much for coming along this journey with me and showing just how much climate change means to you.